This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one website platform to succeed online. Isolin is a synthetic super agonist of the TRPM8 ion channel, also known as the cold and menthol receptor 1, meaning that Isolin activates this cold feeling receptor very well, which is present on the tongue and other mucous membranes of humans, as well as some organs, where its function is not well understood. Isolin is supposedly 200 times as potent and 2.5 times more efficacious compared to menthol, the substance responsible for the cold feeling of mint, meaning that it takes 200 times less isolin to trigger the cold sensation, and it is 2.5 times stronger. This makes it one of, if not the iciest substance known. Now that really sounds like something you would want to try yourself. And that is exactly what I will do, because I can make it myself. You might think, just buy it, but no, look at these prices and quantities. That is like one molecule. No thank you. Isolin can be made from relatively cheap reagents, so it has no business being this expensive. Other than that, it doesn't look like it is used at all, except for random biology studies. Fun. Anyhow, I found out how to make it, and after that, I will try it out to see if it is really that cold or if the internet lied to me. But before we get into that, I would like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online which I've been using to start setting up and building my own website and store, because soon I will have Iceland and some other products for sale on my website. What I really enjoyed when starting out was that there were many flexible templates that are also just really nice from itself. So I only needed to customize them a little bit to fit my needs, and I quickly got what I needed, which saved me a lot of time. Besides that, their Fluid Engine design system allows you to be extra creative in building what you need, as well as extensions that allow you to use many third-party tools to extend the functionality of your website. So go to squarespace.com to try it out for free. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash cameolis to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So to get started, I set up a flask with a stir bar in a heating block and first add in 150 ml of ethanol as a solvent. I then attach a funnel and dump in 50 grams of the cheap precursor 3 nitro acetophenone, which was the whole remainder of the container. As the second reagent, 38 grams of paraformaldehyde, and as the third reagent, 27 grams of diethylamine hydrochloride, both of which are also very cheap. As the catalyst, I pipette in 2.2 ml of concentrated hydrochloric acid. I then attach a condenser and heat this mixture to a reflux for 16 hours. In this reaction, 3 nitroacetophenone reacts with paraformaldehyde and diethylamine in a matic reaction to form the corresponding beta amino carbonyl compound, also called a manic base. How it works is that the paraformaldehyde is first depolarized to methane diol through hydrolysis which is catalyzed by the hydrochloric acid. Methane diol is unstable in non-aqueous solutions and will immediately dehydrate to form formaldehyde and water. The formaldehyde is then protonated by the acid catalyst forming an oxocarbenium that is attacked by the amine of diethylamine. Since the diethylamine will exist in the solution as an equilibrium between protonated and unprotonated, it will just leave behind one equivalent of hydrogen chloride. The resulting intermediate has a hydroxyl. Although less favorable, it can be protonated either by the acid or steal it from the amine. If at the same time the amine is not protonated, it can move its free electron pair to form a double bond and kick off the protonated hydroxyl as water, which is a very favorable leaving group. In the end, we are left with this aminium. Then, we have the 3 nitroacetophenone that exhibits tautomerism and is in equilibrium with its enol form. The enol double bond can attack the amine, and so moves a pair of the amine double bond electrons back onto the nitrogen to balance its charge. At the same time, a free electron pair from the hydroxyl oxygen forms a double bond to make up for it. This results in this intermediate with a protonated ketone that can be easily deprotonated by the formed tertiary amine to give the hydrochloride salt of the product. When I come back, it has become a transparent yellow solution and the reaction should be finished. I take it off heat and let it cool down. Now, in literature, they say it formed a slurry, which for me it didn't, and they precipitated more by adding ethyl acetate. The difference is, I used diethylamine, and not dimethylamine, and perhaps that makes it behave differently here. Because when I added ethyl acetate, nothing happened. So for this product, I will just take the workup procedure from a different paper. So I distill off all of the solvent, and when that's done, a thick liquid is left behind. I then first triturate it with diethyl ether, which will help dissolve impurities, unreacted starting material and help it crystallize. I leave it to stir strongly for a few hours and add some more ether for good measure. When I return, it is all solidified. 
I then decant off all of the ether and discard it, including the floating crystals. I then repeat the same procedure, but with acetone, and I first stab the solid to make it stir. I just leave this to stir overnight. I then come back, and it is all broken up and become a slurry, and it should have dissolved all the remaining impurities. I then set it up for filtration to collect the white solid, and I wash it out and down with some ether. I move it all to this dish, but it's still wet, so I will set it in the oven at 50C for a few hours. After that, it is dry, and the yield turned out to be 37.8 grams, which is 48%, and close enough to literature, so that went pretty well and I will immediately use all of it for the next reaction. I set up a large flask with a funnel, and first add in 300 ml of water and 75 ml of ethanol as a solvent. I then add in all of the product from before and let it stir for a few minutes, while heating to about 50 C. Now I have weighed out 16 grams of 2 aminophenol in the same dish, and mix that with 220 ml of ethanol and then pour all of it into the flask. I then allow this mixture to cool down, and stir at room temperature for 24 hours. In this reaction, the amine of the precursor is replaced by 2-aminophenol, giving the secondary amine product and diethylamine hydrochloride. There seem to be two mechanisms that are considered in literature, though which one is real, I guess people don't know. The first one is deprotonation of the alpha hydrogen, of which the bond electrons form a carbon-carbon double bond, and the diethylamine is kicked off. The diethylamine is a stronger base than the 2-aminophenol, so it will take back the proton. This intermediate then undergoes a Michael addition, where the 2-aminophenol attacks the beta carbon of the intermediate, and a pair of bond electrons from both the carbon-carbon double bond and the carbonyl double bond move to form an enolate. This is quickly balanced through a proton transfer, from the amine to the enolate, to give an enol, which tautomerizes to its keto form, giving the final product. Another mentioned possibility is by direct attack from the 2-aminophenol onto the beta carbon, kicking off the diethylamine, which then deprotonates the amine of the product leaving us with the product in a much simpler manner. When I return, it has become an orange slurry from precipitated product, and I set it up for filtration right away. I then wash it with some 50-50 ethanol water. There's also some darker stuff in there, most of which coalesced into a ring on the bottom. I assume it's mostly an impurity, so I discard it. I then take all of the solid residue, move it to a flask in a heating mantle, and heat it to 50C. I then pull a vacuum and leave it for a few hours to dry. When it's dry, it is a yellow solid, and the yield turned out to be 27.2 grams, which is 61%, and I'm fine with that. So now that I have this product, I can move on to the final reaction to make isolate. We can see that it is very dry, because it's a free-flowing powder, and I pour all of that into this big flask. I then start heating it slightly, and dissolve most of it in 460 ml of glacial acetic acid. As a catalyst, I add 6 ml of concentrated hydrochloric acid, and leave it to stir for a second. But, it all randomly decided to precipitate out, and I'm not so sure why. It probably doesn't matter, and I will just continue with adding the next reactant, in excess, which is 38.5 grams of potassium cyanate. It reacts immediately upon contact with the mixture, and I pour a bunch of the rest in quickly, after mixing it with some acetic acid, to help it flow and mix in. I then dump in all the remaining powder, break up the solid with a spatula, and wash out the beaker with some acetic acid. I then allow it to cool down to room temperature and leave it to stir overnight. In this reaction, the precursor reacts with potassium cyanate in the presence of acetic acid, followed by dehydration catalyzed by hydrochloric acid to form isolin. What happens first is that the potassium cyanate reacts with acetic acid to form potassium acetate and isocyanic acid. Isocyanic acid is an electrophile that can be attacked by a nucleophile, such as the amine from the precursor, giving this intermediate that undergoes a proton transfer. Then all at once, the imine attacks the carbonyl carbon intramolecularly, and a pair of imine double bond electrons move onto the nitrogen. To make up for that, a free electro pair from the hydroxyl forms a carbon-oxygen double bond. After the attack, a pair of carbonyl bond electrons move onto the oxygen, giving this cyclic product that also undergoes a proton transfer, to give this saturated pyrimidone intermediate that contains a hydroxyl. Tertiary alcohols, in general, are more labile, but this one even more so, and it readily undergoes elimination. First, by protonation of the hydroxyl with a strong acid, like the hydrochloric acid catalyst. After this, 
it is kicked off as water, leaving behind a carbon cation, where after, an adjacent carbon is deprotonated to give a double bond and restore the acid catalyst. We are left with this tetrahydropyrimidine 2 ion containing molecule, that is isolin. When I come back the next day, it has become yellow from precipitated isolin, and to make it all precipitate, I add 500 ml of water. I then set it up for filtration and add some more water to check if no more precipitates. I wash the residue twice with some water and then move the wet solid to a flask in a heating mantle. To remove impurities, I triturate it by adding 250 ml of 95% ethanol and then boiling it for 10 minutes. When that's done, I take it off heat and while boiling hot, I filter it all again. I wash it with more 95% ethanol, leaving behind isolin as a yellow solid, which is the color it should be. I transfer all of it to a flask and heat it slightly while pulling a vacuum to remove all of the solvents. In the end, I am left with isolin as a dry yellow powder, and the yield turned out to be 12.8 grams, which is 43%. This is more than the literature, but they made a derivative, so that sounds like a personal problem. So now it is time to taste I mean analyze it biologically. There isn't too much to find about what is most suitable for human testing, so I'll just start off with water, since I see they use that in some cell culture experiments. I'll just take a little scoop, put it into this vial, and try to dissolve it into some water. As we see, its solubility is extremely bad, and after tasting it, I barely felt anything. It also doesn't do anything on my skin, though as far as I'm aware, it is mostly mucous membranes that are affected. I then looked into the original literature where they discovered it, and the researchers tasted it themselves and they used propylene glycol as a solvent. I only have dipropylene glycol, so let's just try that one. They are both used as solvents in cosmetics and safe to ingest. It seems to be slightly soluble. I still see a bunch of particles that don't dissolve. At first, it gives a flash of heat when put on my tongue, and then it tastes slightly sweet from the solvent. Only after a delay of some minutes, a lingering cold sensation starts to kick in, but it feels quite mild, and I don't feel like this solvent did a great job in bringing it to my receptors. This leaves me with one option that I know penetrates cells very well and is also safe to ingest, which is dimethyl sulfoxide. So I repeat the same things, and luckily, it seems to be very soluble in DMSO, giving a transparent yellow solution. Again, it gives an initial flash of warmth, then I shortly taste the solvent, which quickly subsides, and a cold sensation starts to kick in. It first feels like the coldness is pulsing up and down in strength, and then settles to a strong cold sensation that lingers and spreads to my lips. It remained noticeable for at least one hour, and it disappeared only after I had eaten. I agree with what is said online. It does feel like a good 2.5 times colder, compared to menthol, and it requires only a very tiny bit to be effective, and it lingers for a very long time in comparison. So conclusion, isolin is very icy. If you want to try it out yourself, later I will sell it together with WS12 as a kit, so that whoever wants to try both can buy them together and see what it's like. The sale will go live together with the upcoming video in which I will synthesize WS12, and there will be more details about that sale and what it includes in there, so stay tuned. See ya.